Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And today, man, we're going to be looking at issue number two of Heavy Metal. Uh, but before we do that, I want to uh, invite you guys to like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit that bell notification button uh, so that we can let you know whenever we have new videos available. And that helps mitigate the Kayfabe effect, which is what happens whenever we talk about a comic uh, and we put that video out there. The people who are notified get first dibs when they see something they like. They rush out to Amazon or eBay and uh, they could scoop it up at a fair price because by that afternoon, after this video goes live, there's no telling what the cost of these various comics is, is going to be. And if you guys let this video play through to the end, uh, that helps goose the YouTube algorithm and pushes our video content out to other people who are comics fans but not necessarily uh, familiar with uh, Cartoonist Kayfabe. It's the way that we grow the channel, and growing the channel is the way that makes it possible for us to continue uh, to produce these videos on a regular basis. So it's cyclical, man. We need you guys, and we appreciate you very much. Jimmy, let's get into issue number two of Heavy Metal. We did a, we did a video on issue number one that went gangbusters. Um, I had issue two. I got this very, very young because uh, it's almost like uh, Heavy Metal... It was like a store of value, Jim, because for a long time, the oldest issues, like issue one in the comic shops around here cost $15 across the board, pretty much. Every subsequent issue that was a back issue, be it issue number two or 200, $5. Not, not a bad deal. So I started going back and, and, and I didn't pull the trigger on $15 issue number one. That was a lot of money for me. $5 was kind of a lot. But I said, fuck it, I'll get issue number two. I think that's a I think that's a Mobius cover, actually. I don't know, but I was admiring like how it looks wet. You yeah. know, it feels like a real like like salamander or something I would catch whenever I was a kid. Yeah, front cover Mobius. It's a great little detail. And this kind of says it all, man. Front cover Mobius, uh back cover Julier. And yeah. that's a two page spread from the in, inside the comic that we'll see. Uh but man, this blew my freaking mind. When when I was a kid, I uh had just like the shittiest like felt tip kind of kind of pen and i drew this like with hatching in my sketchbook and it was very over rendered man. <laughs> but this this always uh, holds a special place in my heart it was really fun going through that first issue of heavy metal and i kind of couldn't wait to to bust this one open i haven't revisited it in tw 20 years something like this and when you crack open that contents page and you see jacques tardy is going to start this thing off Gadrulier a couple of times through this gimmick, man. Another Von Baudet chunk. Kaza shows up. Mobius. Uh, heavy hitters still, man. The first, the first like two years of Heavy Metal Magazine were really where it was at, man. That set that set the template uh, for the magazine to coast for basically the rest of its tenure. I was noticing rereading this is uh, all these copyright notices, like all the stories that are copyright by the particular artist. Yeah. Um, that's a game changer. You know, like we're reading Marv Wolfman's testimony about Blade and, and there's a lot of talk of copyright in that. Uh, we've heard Rick Veach talk about this. Like that's a big piece. Yeah, it's huge. And just, the, I mean, think about the so, sort of avant-garde nature of the comics in here. And the fact that this was accessible at your 7-Eleven, that's kind of mind-blowing to me, man. It is. In 77, I mean, like, there wasn't anything else like it uh, for a long time. Yeah, not even close. Whenever we were in Hawaii, Alika gave me a copy of this book. Oh, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. funny to see it as an ad in here. <laughs> <laughs> Early returns from Heavy Metal 1, quote, I thought it was a rock music mag. <laughs> I think we might have talked about that a little bit. I don't know if this is printed here. Or if uh, if I colored this because because I definitely did that sort of thing with my this is how you could tell that like I was a little kid I I, I don't know can you tell can you see light bouncing you know off of I it can't, uh, yeah I'm trying to look at it. I can't tell it's such a black and white page that it's funny that it would be four color but maybe it's four color I don't know I don't think it is man like I got hold of these markers and when I found a good peach and I I had like old Overstreet guides and I just put some marker color on top of a black and white photo. And I was like, oh, that looks sick. <laughs> I, I, so I did it whenever uh, whenever I had the opportunity. That's great. Started off, man, with Jacques Tardy. Very, like, proto-Jacques Tardy. This surprised me because I think of him with some of the fanographic reprints, some of the stuff you'd see in Raw, and it's um, I, most of what I see of his is black and white. Yeah. And it's 
heavily rendered. This was like, whoa, what, what's up? The very different style. The registration of my issue is is very off. Uh, you're going to see in the Arzac that the the blue line is far over to the side, uh, and you know that definitely muddies up the color a lot. You could see the sort of blue line underneath uh, underneath this work. But uh, one thing I was curious about after checking this out is whenever you see his work translated into English, the lettering is always the same. So that leads me to believe that he letters uh, these reprints. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Because it's always the same shit. It's the same hand that does this stuff. It's this kind of like tall, slender kind of lettering that I don't see anywhere else. Look at that face and tell me it doesn't look Gilbert. like Gilbert Hernandez. Gilbert, no <laughs> doubt. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Even that one right there. Very much so. I found this style really interesting looking at it. And I don't have too much to say about uh, story-wise no. because I have no idea what any of this says, <laughs> right. if it's a actually accurate or not, if you you know, know Russian. But I was thinking like the style is so bizarre because the face, like his face is very cartoonish, right? But also it's it's uh, realistic proportions on everyone you know on the human characters and everything it's 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 kind of an odd mashup in that way yeah and he he'll uh he'll play with some different line weights but then he'll also just have some deadlines in in the uh the background and these marks are pretty interesting man like on these muck monsters it's it's the thickest line i've ever seen in a tardy image yeah, like you say, it feels, I guess maybe it's early in his career or something. It definitely feels experimental or different than what I associate with him. You always hear about, and in <laughs> places like Man Ben, you see examples of like the Inio Asano episode where he's just going to like thrift stores and flea markets and buying weird cookie dishes yes. that, that he can turn into spaceships. I mean, that's a hair dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. He even has like the pistol grip. <laughs> Tell me that wouldn't be a good wrestler gimmick right here. Yeah, it doesn't look too far off. From like the 60s, maybe? Couldn't pull that off in recent times. Yeah, at some some point, our uh, our hero, and I'm doing air quotes there, is uh, talking about what this Russian's doing with this poor woman, and then, of course, he shoots everybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> no one's getting out alive. When our little muck monster eats this little abortion, it just starts to grow, grow, grow. Yeah, out of the test tube. Yeah. And uh, you get the sense, you know, we don't know what this says, but you get the sense they're like, mission accomplished. That's what they wanted to happen. That's how I read it. And uh, doesn't this kind of shit kind of remind you of, well, you, I guess you started reading comics like when you could actually read, read, read words. But uh, I was, I was grabbing comics like super little before I could really read. And I would kind of like try to figure out what the story was before I could read the words. And this sort of takes me back to that kind of moment. Some uh, some Chester Brown underwater. Yeah. <laughs> it's Adventures of Yiris uh, is how I'm going to pronounce it. I think there was one of these in the first... Uh, right. In the first issue. And it's this kind of adventurer who... It always starts off the same. He's just kind of running around these like scenic locations, like stalking in, in, in the night. The drawing in this is really... Um... It's interesting. It's loose in a lot of places. Like there are places where you just see like a large brush stroke or, yeah. the, or your pen strokes are almost more apparent than like, say, the wood or whatever. It's incredible. Um, it, it has an urgency like in the inking that really it, it looks great. It's amazing, but it just feels gestural at places. It, and, and it really, really works with with the uh, silent sequences mm -hmm. because it's like expediency of storytelling, expediency of line work. Uh, there's a cognitive dissonance w when when you start to have like the the actual conversations and stuff with that same kind of kinetic line. When you slow the story down, it doesn't work as well for for for, for my taste. It's a bizarre story. They lower these women into this pit where like there's I don't know monster god character. I guess they're appeasing, and uh, you know he he sees the naked women and follows them down there and has something prepared for that monster god. It's, uh, you know, like, the, the whole story reminds me a little bit of a Conan kind of story because it is that fantasy setting. Yeah. Um, you know, he pulls out these magic flowers uh, and, and reveals that he's always got some of these tricks on him, you know, from he got it halfway around the world from somebody. 
doesn't it feel like that kind of fantasy setting? It, it's, um, I don't read a lot of fantasy. I was pretty happy with this story. Yeah, sure. All of these uh, comics, they're, they're, they're pretty far out, man. They are, for sure. This issue feels much further out than issue one. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about, uh, after I read this, I was like, this is like an episode of Liquid Television where everything is visually appealing mm-hmm. in, in vastly different ways. And uh, your mileage may vary like per, per story. Like, this is almost like a gag cartoon told through an adventure strip because the whole ending is, like, he kills that big demon or whatever for, uh, you know, for for the worldly pleasures with these with these chicks. Seems like a better use of their time than feeding them to a demon, right? <laughs> it seems like the fantasy of the cartoonist who's making it. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> and the fantasy of the uh, 14-year-olds who are reading it. <laughs> uh, I love that they do the they alternate with like black and white and color and it makes me think of Deadline magazine which mm-hmm. would have been, you know, 10 15 years later you get to see that it makes me think we should look at a Deadline magazine. Absolutely. Um but it's kind of it, it helps with that visual appeal that you're talking about that's like liquid television because it does feel very different in that to go from color to black and white it's a great visual separation. You know, you get a sense this is a different artist, it's a different style, it's a different genre. Get your editors to earn some pay, too, by juggling uh, who gets the, the color treatment and who doesn't. In the introduction piece here, we get a little bit of context mm-hmm. for some of the American strips, at the very least, that show up in here. Inside, we continue the adventures of Sunspot is made by the ex-mortal uh, Von, Von Bode, or Von Bode. Uh, Sunspot was done in black and white and issued as obscure underground comics. Uh, we asked Jack Adler to color them as lovingly as Vaughn might have. So that's a cool piece, it's not Vaughn, Vaughn coloring this stuff. Uh, this Jack Adler guy is a cousin of uh, Howard Stern. There are these incredible covers that have just lush watercolor. That's the stuff that Jack Adler. Also, uh, continuing is Den, Richard Corbin's masterpiece, 96 pages in total. This thing will be, so it gives me the, the impression that it's already been told and Mattel are alone some time ago, man, and they're just doling it out in nickel bags to us. It's funny whenever you know that this started out in black and white to try to then consider it what it would have looked like in black and white because these colors are so vivid. Yes. I like this color. It's it. it pushes that cartoon element kind of over the top to me. Um, but it, it works pretty well for like creating some depth as well. So again, it makes me wonder like what's, what's, what do you get in black and white? looks like Uncle Jack is using markers mm-hmm. for this thing. And I would like to see what the marker look like in relation to the print version, because anytime I would print for markers, way more saturated than what uh, you're seeing with the naked eye on the actual piece of paper. Weird story too. I'll, I'll be honest, and this is maybe going to get some bad, <laughs> bad bad feedback on my part. I don't totally get the appeal of this story. Yeah. You know, I, I know Baudet is this this master and for a variety of reasons and a huge influence. But this story in particular left me kind of like, I, I'm not sure what is happening here. Yeah. Like the thing that I appreciate is his ability to kind of create his own world. But it's almost like Masamune Shiro where like he knows all the rules to it. He ain't, he ain't giving you quite the scoop uh, with this stuff, but um, the sort of, it's very freeing to me to see this kind of drawing. Uh, it's where it's where my head's been at mm-hmm. uh, for, for the past couple of months. So just getting another jolt of this, um, you know, I'm so bound by taping, taping stuff down to the drawing board and ruling out perspective grids and all that kind of thing. To just see a nice free hand that's pure imagination, that's the value that I get from this thing. The layout's really interesting in this four-panel grid style, and then also how he's doing word balloons, like mm-hmm. above and below. Um, you know, like, I would see that stuff with Kyle Baker five, six, seven years later, whenever he's doing some of those proto-graphic novels that he did, like Why I Hate Saturn. A similar uh, process for, like, putting your type above or below your art, yeah. you know, your dialogue. So it's kind of weird to see, like, you know, an underground guy... Uh, a guy who, you know, was really feels like he's doing his own stuff, but in some ways, like, that's a pretty tight organization, the way he's presenting that. I think that that's a trope that would have been done in some editorial cartoons that were multi-paneled. They would, they would do that sort of thing. And it's almost like 
his art comes from that tradition in a, in a certain way. He perverts it to his own purposes. I think this color would have looked so much different in the uh, final version. And it's interesting how it gets like that little like lens flare, like when you don't uh, increase your lasso tool by two mm -hmm. pixels. Right. <laughs> what is that called? Yeah, that's right. That's that's flare, totally right. A flare line, something like that. Um, also, uh, like the same size panels, you know, like he's working in this, in these square panels, like this is an Instagram comic, yeah. you know, uh, talk about technology that, that he way anticipated, but working in that same size panel, like we've experimented with that in various grids and stuff. It's pretty interesting because it's, you're solving the same compositional problem over and over and you can get very comfortable with that composition and have these ideas that are built for those square panels. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's. Something about like the big square, it's kind of unattractive to me, but he really figured out a way to like, you know, bifurcate these pages and yeah. make it look pleasing. These, a lot of these panels are just striking. Yeah. You know, it, it really feels like this could be a, uh, this could be a class assignment, you know, where like it's a lot of constriction in some ways, but then also like do your magic in there. Yeah. And I think he does. I think compositionally, there's a lot of pleasing panels. Phil's... I mean, it also feels like a cartoon. It you does. Know, it, this does. A it feels cinematic. Yeah, it feels absolutely cinematic. This Julie A piece, man, is like this opening sequence. This is something to steal, I feel like. It's like, boom, one panel. You even wonder, like, what the fuck? Love it. I'm, I'm such a boom, fan of two. this kind of like uh, playing with your page in negative space. Yeah. And you don't see it very often early on. So this is this is bold. And this is your uh, opposite of your widescreen yes. that, that we talk about in the early 2000s being popular but so striking dramatically, you know, like that's such a, uh, we go from square panels with boat eight to these like vertical, just assault. I like to think when he's doing all this filigree and stuff, he's on the phone with Mobius shooting the shit, <laughs> yeah. talking about stuff. And little did we know that Juliet invented rune. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right? This kind of, yeah, definitely this kind of drawing, it's just pleasurable to look at that sort of line treatment. One of the um, things that we were taught to just be considerate of, uh, if we were not already in art school, is the planes of the form that you're drawing. It informs the lighting and stuff. And like one of the things that they would show us is like you do the wire frame, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, just like in like a light blue line to just figure out where the curves are of of your figure. So these lines are going with the form. This is tapping in, like, that image generation that we look at, a lot of times I'll hear people say that this was popular with, uh, uh, like, outsider artists, right? Kids in high school loved it. Yeah. This feels that way. Like, totally. that kind of noodling. Like, I mean, I, I know dudes that drew this way. Right. You know, there's something about it. I still draw that way sometimes. There's something almost pleasurable about that kind of line work. I mean, this is this is this is metalhead comics, man. Yeah, this is fever dream stuff. These big images, like this, is just that's that's the thousand people that read this comic. That was the favorite thing they they'd ever seen in their life <laughs> up to that point. And I don't blame them. Might even have some like Walt Simons. Like I, I could see Walt doing this kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think these kind uh, of lines. Julie is a, somebody whose name has come up a lot with Walt Simonson in terms of influence and stuff, and that page really shows it. Yeah. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comic books that we make. Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one, is on the stands today. In the first week of April comes Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number two. That's the Pumpkins issue of Red Room. And of course, last year uh, saw Red Room, the Antisocial Network, the idea for Red Room. It's murder on the dark web for fun and profit. Every issue is completely self-contained, and it is a gory splat fest, to say the least. Uh, the rest of the the Ed Piscor bib bibliography that is currently in print, you have three volumes of oversized X-Men Grand Design retelling the entire story of the X-Men saga up through the origins to Days of Future Past, four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree documenting in a very linear fashion the history of hip hop and rap music, and WYSIWYG, Portrait of a Serial Hacker, charting the life of a computer hacker from the earliest days of high technology up to uh, WikiLeaks. Out in stores now, Jim Ruggs, Hulk, Grand Design, Monster, the first half of uh, the, the Incredible Hulk lore, out on the stands as we speak, various flavors, the Peach Momoko is coming out soon. How's that work, Jim? April 14th. It'll be in stores everywhere. April 16th. <laughs> 40, 40 pages in issue documenting the history of the Incredible Hulk. 
there is a banger on every single page. Get it while it's hot. This thing is not going to be in the stores for long. And uh, before you know it, comes Hulk Grand Design uh, Madness with uh, some very cool variant covers uh, by Ed McGinnis and Jeff Darrow to kind of goose those uh, bookshelves in your local comic shops. And the rest of the Jim Rugg bibliography in stores now. Plain Janes with Cecil Castellucci and uh, rapidly going out of print soon. If you see it in your comic shops, get your hands on it right away, man, because we don't know when this is going to be back in print. Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. Get these numbers up high on those Amazon charts. We love seeing it. We thank you so much. We appreciate your patronage. And now that we're done paying the bills, let's get back to the video. A lot of dream sequences in these damn comics. Man, and in, in, in a dark story. So <laughs> our hero ends up, uh, this is the story, right? He's in love with this, this servant girl and like his uh, fellow family members just abuse her in front of him, leading him to then decide he's going to kill them all. <laughs> <laughs> There's your back cover image right there. Very cool to get to see it in black and white line art like this. This is almost feels like you're looking at the original art piece, you know, the big oversized piece. But yeah. it's cool to see it go from color to black and white. And man, like, we've seen versions of this kind of thing done kind of poorly, like like manically, but poorly. That's the thing, like, that's almost the language of drawing, especially in comics and in black and white comics. That's a big time, like... Yeah, we've seen thousands of examples like that. Here's a deep pull for you. Whenever Spawn was first introduced, there was a drawing of Spawn with like the Spawn hand-drawn logo behind him, not the logo that they came to use on the book. Yeah. And this is how, how it looked to me because right. it had like the lines to give a little bit of shading gradation on it and then that rough outer edge, big heavy line on the outside. One of the things that comes to mind when I think of Julier's uh, artwork is, is the symmetry. So you cut this in half. Interesting, yeah. And you have these totally. pieces man so it's like one original drawing to center stuff up but these are like you know you draw half of oh, it yeah. flip it you say symmetry it's unmistakable once once you see it he also is really good for all the line work and the ornamental kind of drawing also great with the spotting of the blacks yeah, whenever yeah. he goes in with that it's like yep striking shape very well balanced pages and knowing like see he he'll use that pen man and he'll he'll scratch some stuff in there but he knows when to lighten up, you know, when, when there's like a focal point, when there's something that he needs you to pay attention to. Nice lettering on this story as well. Makes me wonder like how they're getting these things lettered now that you've, you know, you mentioned it on the, on that last, on the Tardy piece. I do know that John Workman worked for the company at some point. I, I don't know. I didn't search for his name in the uh, credits, but at some point he jumps on board and might be uh, a main guy for that stuff. This is foretelling the, uh, the future, 1996. <laughs> All right, man, the plant's obsolete. You may now proceed to uh, to off yourselves. Your services are no longer needed. <laughs> oh, man. <That's, laughs> what else can you do but laugh? You know what you could do is scratch out 96 and, and push that up to about 2026. <laughs> right. <laughs> Soup is good food. All right, man, unmistakable. Got the new den. Look at this. Look at that coloring. All this, like super dude this is a hot sun that's beaten down on this right here here's the other part of reading a comic like this i feel like my childhood in the 80s it all comes out of this yeah you know and it's funny because some of it was like watching old movies that would play on tv that were probably from this era but also like it had to inspire at least a generation that followed them yeah and the the cool thing about getting this one uh, i was familiar with the heavy metal movie to begin, man. Had no idea that it was a magazine or anything like that. Uh, so Den is one of the features in the movie. And uh, you get the origin of Den in the movie. You get the origin of Den here. Uh, so I do think, and will always think, of Den's voice as sounding like John Candy, <laughs> which is the movie. Hilarious. Uh, Look at the use of the secondary colors. You know, the green, orange, purple. It's so... It's perfect, but also so unlikely in a comic book. You know, you think of like, if this is sold at your, you're picking this up at your 7-Eleven or something, and next to it are just all primary color superhero comics. You right. know, they're all red, green, and yellow, or red, blue, and yellow. 
not this stuff. Like this is almost like the sick version. This is your your uh, UHF, you know, deep dive. It just doesn't quite look right in terms of what all these other comics look like. It's the same ingredients, but man, he's playing a different song. Yeah, so some of the wording, it, it makes me appreciate Jan Stranod <laughs> in a way because it's just a lot of show and tell. Yes. But then you'll get little bits of like, the blow should have killed him, he was hardly stunned. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to give him a chance to think like, like that makes sense. But a lot of it is like literally telling you what you're seeing. But to me, like the best of like, uh, the best of Richard Corbin in terms of storytelling are these kind of moments where there's just an eerie silence. Yeah. I do like this lettering though, because it further adds to that. Like, what am I looking at here? It just feels alien. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like there are, there are not other comics like that. Yes, How about the great. severity of that punch right there, Jimmy? He just nails it with that green color. Yeah. it's It pops off of this page. <laughs> that is a great punch. <laughs> just, it's obscene, man. I know that his, his figures are, you know, like there's a, there's a cartoon quality to his figures. But at the same time, like the way they're rendered and everything, they're very, I don't want to say realistic, but, but. The coloring is more realistic than, again, what you're seeing on all these other comic books. And then you juxtapose that with what looks like totally a cartoon monster out of, you know, whatever B-movie you want to name. It's such a great juxtaposition. Doesn't look far from Mondo Gecko from uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja yes. Turtles. Here's our origin of Den. And then we push the palette to a different place. We're Amazing. no longer in the hot desert. We're in a different world. This thing... The amount of time I spent staring at this right here, yes. dude, unbelievable. You know what's bizarre? From my angle sitting here, all I see is the Max. Even <laughs> shapes. I mean, this is your Max glove. Right, yeah. He did a version of this in that Turtles in Time mm -hmm. issue when, when the characters are, are speeding through through time. But that is just, that's unbelievable right there. His work's so interesting to me because of how cinematic it is in certain ways and how much it is completely a comic and a cartoon in other ways. To get that in the same, practically every single panel has those two elements and they seem they seem like you could only do one. <laughs> this image right here, like I don't think it's what he intended because that definitely looks like a mouth of like <laughs> some big cartoon head monster. Right. I love it you get like the, uh, the Kansas countryside as well. <laughs> and just the skinniest homunculus. <laughs> like Packer Wood, who's then going to become his... Dude, this is this is the story of your comic fan. Absolutely. You know? Skinny little twerp guy, goes to another dimension, and is a badass. We appreciate Shadow <laughs> uh, in panels like that this. That looks like a turtle tail. <laughs> it does. <laughs> <sighs> so cool. I can't, I cannot express how much this is what I love about comics. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is what comics are all about, man. This right here. It's so fun. Again, if you're picking this up in 1977, it's just got to be paradigm shifting. I mean, it's, st it's stuff like this that could set you on a path. Like, Absolutely. Like you could be a kid in, in the 7-Eleven, pick up this comic, see all this craziness and just be like, I just, maybe I'll just do this. Also, you could go home and just burn all your art supplies after looking at this. Because <laughs> this, this shit's magic. If you're you know, working on a Ross Andrews Spider-Man copy and then you see this, I don't think I even have the art tools. All right. <laughs> yeah, to this day, I look at this and I don't even know how you, how you, you accomplish that. Another great use of negative space. Uh, you know, that's a lot of the page showing through there. Right. And very effectively. I mean, I don't want a busy background behind that, that middle panel. We've seen this artist in that first issue, this Conquering Armies mm -hmm. story, very Wally Wood inspired. It is, and, and incredible. This is another one of those incredible like pen and ink artists. Yeah. And I marvel at how much he puts on a page. And he'll do this kind of thing that, like, watching Man Ben episodes, you see these guys get these kind of marks out of their, their fine liners and stuff, where they just kind of like lightly let let the weight of the pen touch the paper and drag it across and just get like the slightest little bits of yeah. uh, pigment on the fibers of the paper does it, it you don't press hard enough to even get into the grooves there's so much stuff and i, I hope this detail is showing but it's almost like a million of these tiny almost like speckling and then like even the edges of some of these these uh rocks and lines are like feathered out with 
the finest line. It, it, some of that, man, like the the mangaka from Manben, they would use even a ballpoint and pen mm -hmm. to, to get that stuff and not exactly know how it's going to look in the printed version, but, you know. Yeah, this feels like if you're into Warrens, if you're into old ECs, if you're into any of that stuff, like this is an apex kind of like, you're loving it. And, yeah. and, and how much of a, you know, like we talk all the time about line density and, and sort of the uh, the way inking is worshipped as, as Wednesday Warriors. This is just, how could you put more line work on a page? Yeah, totally. Totally, man. It still f has flow to it, man. Mm -hmm. Like it, it very easily uh, could not, like if he put maybe one more fucking mark, it would be completely unreadable. But he's he's figured out his, his system because this is not, this is not Tothian composition mm, in terms no. of like where you put your blacks and all that kind of stuff. You got to study these images a little bit. Yeah, super dense. You feel like you're going through a jungle fighting these cats. Uh, and then whenever we break down into, you know, we do need to understand what's happening. We get our close up features, but also like pretty distinct characters, right? One guy's face is all ripped apart. Another guy <laughs> missing, missing his fingers. Yeah, man. That's what happens when you play with those M80s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He, they hear tell, man, that there's a dude that's going to be, that can grow, grow limbs back. And that's what the, that's the MacGuffin for this story. Also the environments that we've seen already, that those cliffs, the jungles, everything. Now we're going to go to some kind of magician that's off the grid. This is like. Berserk. Like Barry Windsor Smith, like wish you would have put some of that stuff in, in those old Conans. Man, it feels like studio, like like another one of those examples of like the most line work you can put in a black and white drawing. Wait, so what's remarkable about this, like when you really like break this down, is like the perspective of spider webs. You know, no no hard edges, no straight lines, but clearly there are webs that are like deeper in the background. Mm -hmm. And like when you really look at it, you could kind of figure out how he he got there. And like there's something about it, like there's consideration to the to this stuff more than like the stuff that we would see in like 1990s marvel like sam keith or uh like mcfarland spider-man stuff there's there's a lot more kind of thought into the placement here bernie wrightson would do that kind of shit with with uh, his yeah, like house of call. mysteries house of secrets kind of spider web stuff and also you know graham ingles before him it's another nice use of leaving some negative space out yeah um and also you could almost just have two silhouettes there except we're not doing that. This <laughs> this artist, like, when I see this, I'm thinking, dude, you're fighting your nature. I want to see this original page, and I bet you there's so much white out where he's like, you know what? It it's a wonderful sense. composition. Look how it just mirrors, you know, our guy in the foreground mirrors this this wild location that he's heading into. Talk about scary. This is what this shit should look like. Whenever these these fantasy characters are going out to find a sorcerer that's buried deep in, in who knows where this is what it should look like this guy i don't uh, want to walk into that place with his previous work in that first issue of heavy metal his um landscape design is second to none he, he must have every issue of national geographic like at hand or something man because he he captures that stuff he must do plain air painting like he understands backgrounds Totally. This fucking character had haunted my dreams. <laughs> like, this was probably the most horrific of the strips in here to me. He must have had a National Geographic or something with lizards. Totally. <laughs> There's so much lizard work that's about to come, and I love it. I love that that's a flourish, because you could have just sent that guy. Yeah. That would have been plenty. You're sending some monster sidekick to go confront this guy that's coming, that's approaching. But no, we have to also unleash the army of lizards. Jimmy, that's the stuff that, like... The great lesson from visiting the mangaka in Japan when I was out there uh, that I took back from the east is just you got to push everything further. Like when like do your pencil, like do something and it's dope, but add something, add something every time, man. And uh, it's the spirit of guys like Jeff Darrow, yeah, you know, like we see his percent. work and it's like he's just pushing what, what's in that desert that Shaolin Cowboy is going to going to find next. And I, I feel like that's the spirit of what we're seeing in a lot of these stories so far. Great lighting using pointillism. This dude's an ink slinger. Yeah, this is the stuff if I had as a kid, I would have been trying to copy in my sketchbooks. 
this is definitely an extension of the shit that I saw, like, when I saw that Wally Wood exile story, and you see this, and you're just like, it's hopeless. Look at the fireplace. I mean... (laughs) And the lighting. Brilliant. The lighting, the clay coming from that fire. Like, this guy, this guy, they train these people classically. I was thinking that, you know, like if you start copying this, you're not going to learn to draw. You, you might learn, you, you know, you might learn to copy one of these panels, but that's the thing. There's a foundation underneath all of this. Right. Guys like uh, Brian Talbot come to mind. That's a good call. With, yep. with this work, it, it, it feels very British. You know, I would see stuff in action and battle that would look like this. But a lot of those artists are what the Brits call European. Mm-hmm. And then that final piece, man. <laughs> they, they grow his hands back only to cut his fingers off. Is that? Is, did I read that story that, right? That is right. I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure about that as an ending, but I do love that page as an ending. Unforgettable image, man. Burnt into my brain forever. Such a good, again, it feels like the, the theme that I keep going back to is this use of negative space on a page and that weird splatter design for a background. Phenomenal. So I mentioned uh, liquid television before and mm-hmm. there would be... Uh, sequences like a like notebook theater or stick figure theater and this feels like a stick figure theater uh chapter of our magazine where i think when we last checked that first issue out these these uh collages by uh norman uh rubington it's it, it's it is collages he's, he's chopping this stuff up from various sources pacing things up and making uh new 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 imagery am i right yeah um Although I, I love this and I feel like you could kayfabe it a little bit. Like you could yeah. add a drawn element into this yeah. and it would, it, you would just take for granted like, oh yeah, that's something that he found also. I think these are brilliant. I like collage and like collaging this type of engraving image. I think that's a really cool idea. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of the Fumetti that we see like uh, a Harvey Kurtzman doing in Help. Yeah. Um, except, you know, you're doing it almost with the clip art and then doctoring it. Um you know, like this could be a piece that, that might be an added drawing or something. Right. And you can see where he's taking one element from another. Yeah, I love that. These are, this is where you could start to see it kind of break down a little bit on these pieces. It's a little bit less of a gestalt. There's a little bit of a separation there. There was a comic in the early 2000s that I would see called Punks. I think Image ended up publishing a few of it. Cody Chamberlain, I'm going to say. It's it's a deep pull. I may be off on that, but, but it had a similar look to this, but almost like photocopied version. So that would have been your, um, you know, rather than like the engraving lines, that would be like the noise from the photocopier, almost like a a faux punk look. Um, but it it was a similar concept, you know, where you're like, you were putting these pieces together to uh, create your images. Um, I like it. I, I think it's an interesting look. This one just confuses me. Yeah, dude. Like another uh, piece of liquid television yes. would be like the uh, puppetry. There was, there was that like blonde biker lady puppet right. thing. And that will be uh, the Roger Big Jim sequence <laughs> of issue two. Pretty bizarre. And again, I'm going to reference Harvey Kurtzman doing, uh, you know, doing doing photo uh, Fumetti kind of comics. It's so strange. Yeah, I, I think technically the stuff to think about would be like imagine having to like resize fucking photos to fit your needs man for for a comic page easy to do in photoshop not easy to do practically absolutely also the lighting absolutely like you could just tell it's like some tabletop like with these like diffuse lights like we have right here except you use a very yellow warm light These are wild. Once again, I say, if you pick this up in 1977 and go home with it and you're an aspiring cartoonist, the amount of techniques that you're exposed to in this issue, kind of like mind blowing. Like you can make almost anything from the parts that you find in this issue. Then we start getting fourth wall with it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, like we're going off into space. Like this is some acid flashback, fucking post, post sixties, pharmaceutical grade LSD inspired bullshit and now now we're like breaking the fourth wall it's a good strip for um how important lettering is in this strip it's a giant part of what you're reading and how you're going through it yeah just just strange very weird 
Yeah, I'm sure there were there were a few readers of this magazine that were um, not entering sober. <laughs> yeah. And, and here's our Kaza piece. Yes. He does some really cool stuff in heavy metal. I was excited to see his name in the credits, and I'm uh, very happy with this. I feel 70s as fuck. Totally. Fits into that, that drug idea uh, that we're talking about. Doing that, like, no hard hard blacks, except, like, up here you get some men, but, like, always cutting it in. That's a 90% black. Yes. 95% black, just using white pointillism. Yeah, and really just a huge emphasis on art. This is very different storytelling than, than a lot of the comics that we see today. Super surreal. Just kind of... Uh, Going on the fly, I feel like. How about that Woodring vibe? Totally. 100%. I mean, he had to... This ha I don't know if he's ever seen this or not, but I bet if you showed it to him, he would enjoy it. Jim Wood Woodring. Jim Woodring, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the textures and stuff, like, once you get to this point, it's hard not to see some Woodring on these pages. Absolutely. Like, even this. Like, yeah, totally. Like, like, all this stuff. It's just... Uh, here's what a Woodring universe looks like if you put, like, a human character into it. I love this, uh, like, like the eye gets so striking in this top, you know, once she opens her eyes after consuming whatever this fruit is, and as we kind of roll through with all these round motifs, and uh, now our moon is like that eye, right out of her head, yeah. becoming that eyeball in the in the landscape. <laughs> and there's that unforgettable image. This is probably like uh, by my, uh, my, my second um, most memorable image. From... I was going to say, this would be a striking one to get hold of when you're young. Yeah. It's just gorgeous art, though. He's such a powerhouse. And for anybody unfamiliar with Kaza, we do have uh, Chris Cool was like his big graphic novel um, from from I think the late '60s. But go check out that video. Uh, it shows his work in full color, and it's it's phenomenal. Like he's just this visual artist tour de force. Speaking of, yeah, well, this is one of my favorite Arzak Jeez. stories. And unfortunately, the print of this one, man, like the plate is way shifted. Like you could literally see these kind of blue lines, mm -hmm. just the haze of it, very far off. Like the way they used to say um, a print job was successful is if the registration was off uh, only like by uh, two millimeters. It's about five millimeters worth of uh, registration. By the way, I pointed out the um, secondary colors of Corbin. We've got the same thing going on here. The yeah. greens and oranges. We'll get a little bit of purple, you know, maybe in like in our shadows on our wings, but uh, that, that kind of secondary color... Uh, it just sets this stuff apart. The hues are all married. That's that's kind of the difference in a way of um, like the Corbin piece where like it's psychedelia. You know, it's sizz sizzling colors. You know, where you got like these crazy magentas, these mm -hmm. big bright oranges. Like this is all s more subtle. Like all, all maybe some yellow underpainting underneath all of it to kind of tighten everything up. Love that it's wordless too. You know, thinking again of what you're getting in this issue, like now you've got a Mobius wordless comic that yeah. you're following through. Yeah. His stuff is the most successful out, out of all this shit uh, because I don't care about your kayfabe words for your universe and the things that are happening in your universe. It's very easy to understand. He's flying through this hairy terrain. He's got his like mule mm -hmm. to carry his bullshit. And he's got, you know, his stallion, man, the one that he, he's got his Corvette, his Lambo. <laughs> and that's just, you know, the trailer. But guess what, man? The trailer hiccups, flies a little too low, gets sucked up. Yeah. It's like a video game world. It lets us know what the surface of this planet looks like and yeah. how important that stallion is that it's under you. And he's real uh, unhappy about that stuff, man. Yeah, it's great. It is great storytelling because you can kind of see the, uh-oh. And then the angry aftermath. His Lambo's getting hungry. Got to hook it up with a cookie. <laughs> and that's a pretty iconic image. Yeah. A game called Shadow of the Colossus for PlayStation 2. It was one of the last, uh, one of the last games I played before b becoming a comics pro. And while playing that game, the end of it, the end, of, like the sort of big reveal, was apparent to me early. Because what would happen is there's no like little minions that you fight. You just fight 16 big bosses. But the bosses, every fight is epic. Like you're fighting these big giants and it could take a half hour to beat one of these guys. And there are two or three of these fucks that you're going through a terrain. 
and there's nothing stopping your way, there's no problem, you're climbing up on big towers to fuck with the dude in his house. Like, 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 why are you doing that? Why are you being a jerk? <laughs> and that's what Arzak is doing. You know? This guy didn't do anything. <laughs> Just yeah, like the using, rendering on that figures. Using those lines to follow the form kayfabe in this anatomy <laughs> using his knowledge of actual human being anatomy and animal anatomy to like design these characters like the, a guy with this kind of vision you hire him in hollywood i wonder if this ran black and white initially you know somewhere or if it was conceived of as black and white and then went color because the rendering is so extreme in black and in the line work like yeah. he is really rendering these things look at how far off this registration is man it's insane. It feels like every page is iconic. Absolutely, man. Like, that's just mind-blowing. This is the, that stuff that makes fucking Kevin Eastman wet. <laughs> He's, he really adopted these kind of marks. It's interesting to think, because he's, like, part Corbin, part Von Bode, part Mobius. Like, mm -hmm. he's the dude that was going to 7-Eleven, scooping this stuff up. Look at the perspective on this shit. You know, whenever uh, Drulier was doing some of that filigree, this is what Mobius is drawing while on the phone with him. I love this part where we see like, oh, that thing that he's sitting on is not what it started out as. Yeah. Like, that's a piece of something that's left over from who knows what. Got some rebar. Some other world. Love that giant hand. That I think this speaks to the storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, like for a wordless story, figuring out what to focus on is so vital. And I mean, that's that's a great panel and... And I bet you Sam Keith looked at it. Well, there he is hanging. <laughs> Our boy's catching a meal. Those, those fingers are falling back further yeah, and further. Yeah, you can see him digging in. <laughs> and further. And then uh, Chekhov's grass. Yes. Chekhov's crab right. grass, man. Right. You establish it in Act 1. Pays off in Act 3. And that's where your trip starts to go bad. These guys who are partaking in substances are getting to this point and being like, man, the deadly grass. It's coming. It's coming for you. Festival. Love that lettering. Yeah. The drawing is really awesome, man. Mm -hmm. Shades of Underground Comics. Spain Rodriguez yep. comes to mind. Absolutely. Uses more of a deadline. You know, this guy's using rapidographs and, and uh, Spain wouldn't fuck with that. Yeah, I like the look of this story a lot. And it's just a gigantic blowout concert is what we're uh, what we're seeing here. I think three million people show up. Don't take the brown acid. Just a, just you know another one of those kind of like great anthology pieces where you got your heavy hitters and then you got some filler. Uh, the the difference is that like all the fillers kind of like looks good. It does. It it. I never feel like I wish there was something else instead of this page. Um, and I hate to say it, you know, like like wrestling cards, they talk about having these matches where you kind of catch your breath or this is when you can go to the bathroom or whatever after like a really hot match. And it's not exactly what happens here, but it does feel like it's balanced super well. Yeah. You know, the, the change ups from certain stories or super intense line work to then we're going to go to like a photo collage kind of stuff. It kind of works. You know, it's back to that liquid television analogy. And there's probably some other examples like that. But it's like this. It, it's just a well composed issue. It was fun going through this thing. It does make me want to go through issue three. Yeah, absolutely, man. Go through your archives, Jimmy. See if you have it. And if you don't, we got digital versions of everything. And we might have to continue investigating uh, heavy metal. The inspiration I'm getting from this, it's its a real jolt that I've, that I've been getting go, going through these. It feels like such a before and after moment. Like... So much stuff, I think, was influenced by this. Yeah. Like, this really feels like it changed American the American comics landscape in Absolutely. terms of, like, so much more is possible on a page. And I, I think we see that, you know, even in things like Epic Illustrated in the early Absolutely. 80s. Like, it just becomes this visual force. This would have been the greatest thing I had ever seen, you know, if it, t to be 12 when this is published and get hold of this. Yeah. I mean... It changed your life. Where's and this? I think it did. I think there's a generation that it did. Yeah, yeah. They, once again, Kevin Eastman. You think about this in the context of like the, 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 the comics landscape where the undergrounds are all but dead in a, in a lot of ways. Um, something like this comes along. Is, is, is this the size that inspires Arcade? I don't, I don't remember very many other uh, magazine-sized um, underground comics. They were all comic size or smaller. 
That's interesting. I also think like, when does Jack Katz start First Kingdom? Yeah. Um, it might have been right before this, but it, it feels like this is coming out in 77. Like, we've got the direct market is sort of starting to form at that point. Self-publishing is going to be a thing over the next several years. I mean, this had to be electricity for a lot of cartoonists that we might not even look at and think heavy metal, but it had to be part of the mix, you know, even if you weren't getting it directly, like... It's paradigm shifting. Absolutely, man. Per perfect inspiration for like, oh yeah, now we're going to have a new way to sell comics over the next uh, 40 years. <laughs> Take a look at this first. Before you start your self-publishing venture, just just look at what's possible. I think these first couple of years worth of uh, heavy metals are going to have to go under the microscope. Jimmy, you good to go? Yes. Okay, favors like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, we'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jim? Hulk Grand Design, it is in your comic shops now, unless it's sold out. Uh, pick that up right away. Hulk Grand Design Madness will be out uh, in the end of April. And um, you can join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg to kind of see more of my art and comics. Red Room Trigger Warnings is coming out on the stands as we speak. Issue one is out on the stands right now. Depending on when you're watching this video, issue number two is out on the stands or about to be on the stands. Uh, you can read these comics before they hit paper at my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. Every issue is completely self-contained, so if you see an issue, grab an issue. You're going to get a complete experience. Murder on the dark web for fun and profit is the tagline to explain to you quickly what Red Room comics are about. And you can get to all of these uh, links in my link tree in the description below this video to get your hands on this stuff. What else do we have, Jim? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Keep the lights on, keep the videos coming. Jimmy, give them those marching orders. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.